Welcome. Uh, it's really wonderful to have all of you here tonight. My name is Karina Nielsen. I'm the Executive Director of the Estuary and Ocean Science Center here at San Francisco State University. <laughs> uh, okay, now I'm going to turn meat red. Uh, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate um, it is uh, really my extraordinary pleasure tonight uh, to introduce our speaker, uh, the Honorable Dr. Jane Lubchenco. And uh, I, I almost feel a little awkward saying it that way, only because um, uh, Jane and I go back a long way. So we're in academia, we have kind of families in some ways that are academic families. And so Jane and I are academic families. She's my academic mom. So, <laughs> um, so. Uh, Jane uh, Lubchenco comes to us today. She's a, um, a university distinguished professor, and she's a marine studies advisor to the president of Oregon State University. Um, and she did her undergraduate degree at Colorado College. Uh, she did her master's degree at the University of Washington, and she did her um, PhD at Harvard University. Uh, and in 1975, she, um, sorry, excuse me, 1977, she started at Oregon State University and she's been there uh, ever since. She did a short stint as an assistant professor at Harvard before moving there. Um, one of the interesting things uh, about Jane's trajectory professionally was that for the first few years of her uh, professional life at Oregon State is that she shared a tenure track position with her husband, Bruce Menge, um, and they did that with purpose and intention uh, so that they would both have time uh, to um, have family time, have work-life balance. Uh, but it was a very pioneering, bold move, and there weren't very many universities that did that. So that's one of the cool things about Jane. There's a lot of cool things about Jane. I'm going to tell you about a few of them because I'm so incredibly proud of her. Um, she, was, uh, she worked at the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, for a while as a research associate. She was visiting professor. She's worked internationally, uh, University of West Indies, uh, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, Universidad Católica um, in Chile, University of Oceanography in Quindao in China, um, University of Canterbury in New Zealand. She's certainly a globe trotter or an ocean trotter. Um, she uh, served from 2009 to 2013 uh, as the chair of the Department of Zoology in, uh, at Oregon State. So full, full academic life. Um, she also <laughs> has many, many honors. She was on the National Science Board for two terms. She was nominated for each term by uh, President uh, Bill Clinton and confirmed by the Senate twice for that. As we know, that's not always an easy task. <laughs> um, she then served as undersecretary for, uh, for the Department of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere. And that position is the administrator for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. From 2009 to 2013, she was nominated by former President Barack Obama and confirmed by the US Senate again. Um, she was, uh, took a break after that uh, and served as a visiting, uh, distinguished visiting uh, scholar in public service at Stanford University in uh, uh, Mimi and Peter Haas uh, named position. And after that, as if this wasn't enough, she was the inaugural US science envoy for oceans with the US State Department for 2014 to 2016 under Secretary John Kerry uh, and President Obama. So. She's done a lot of public service. Um, in addition to this amazing public service, you might ask, well, why would she be called for all this public service? Well, she's an extraordinary scholar. Um, she has uh, eight of her publications. This is an academic accolade, so I don't expect all of you to maybe know what this is, but she has eight science citation classic papers. So that means other scholars think her work is, is really quite important. They cite her work a lot, um, so that's huge. She was elected, uh, she is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, many other important societies. She was president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, the International Council for Science, the Ecological Society of America. Um, she was given the most prestigious award ever given by the National Academy, or given by the National Academy of Sciences, the Public Welfare Medal, um, which is a really huge honor. Uh, and for her public service, in addition, she received the highest honor the Coast Guard gives to a civilian. 
the U.S. Coast Guard Public Service Award. So I'm telling you all this because I think you should know what a rock star Jane is before she gives her talk. Uh, <laughs> and it is my incredible honor and pleasure to introduce her, and she is going to talk to us about hope. Hope for people and hope for the ocean. Uh, without further ado, welcome Jane. Thank you. Evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's really a treat for me to be here. One of the uh, most exciting things for a teacher is to see your students thrive and succeed. And I could not be more proud of Karina as my academic daughter. And I know my husband, Bruce Menge, who is her academic father, shares our excitement and pride in her. So thank you, Karina, for the invitation, and thank you for what you're doing. It's really great to be here. I've enjoyed speaking with some of you this evening, and I really do appreciate all of your uh, attendance tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, hello to everybody that's in the over overflow room. I appreciate your being here as well. I want to focus our attention tonight on hope, and hope for the ocean and people, obviously, is my title. For anybody paying attention to the news, that title might seem a bit at odds with a lot of the doom and gloom that we hear about the ocean. If you're reading the newspaper, listening to the radio, watching TV, watching your screens, uh, you see news about climate change, ocean acidification, plastic pollution, coral reef bleaching, uh, dead zones. It sort of seems like one bad news story after another. All of that is out there. And it is an immense challenge, but it's not an insurmountable challenge. And tonight, I hope to convince you that there actually are some amazing things that are underway, that if we can figure out how to replicate them, how to scale them up, we could turn this narrative around. So the bottom line for my remarks tonight are going to be simply how connected we are to the ocean. Those of you who have the privilege of living close to the ocean can feel that connection. Not everyone is aware of it, but we are so, people around the planet are connected to the ocean. Uh, our future is connected to the future of the ocean. There are unprecedented problems, but solutions do exist. Yes, we can create new solutions, but we actually have a wealth of them at hand. We're just not using them to the extent that we need to. And for that to happen, the pace of change needs to change. I think it's time for a new narrative about the ocean. When I was growing up, uh, <clears throat> and for most of human history, the narrative around the ocean was, it's so immense, it's so bountiful, that nothing we can do can possibly affect the ocean. It is too big to fail. Now the narrative has become, it's such a mess. We have so many problems, it's too big to fix. I think it's time for a new narrative that says, it is so important to our future, we can fix it, Let's get on with doing it. And I hope you will agree with me by the end of the talk. So in addition to that message of hope and a new narrative, you all, whether you are scientists or citizens, have a key role to play in framing this new narrative. So let's dive in. Uh, I'm going to give you a sense of where I'm coming from on this so that you can uh, understand my thought process. Pay a little attention to why should you care, if you don't already. Uh, what are the problems, what are some solutions, and what can you do? So that's sort of my uh, overarching uh, path tonight. Um, I've been connected to the ocean for much of my career. I grew up in Colorado, but I've been working in and around the ocean uh, for much of my professional life, uh, doing work around the planet, and seeing problems and solutions uh, globally. So almost or over 40 years as an academic researcher, 
but also, as Karina mentioned, having an opportunity to be a public servant, to serve citizens of this country uh, as the head of NOAA, uh, working uh, with members of the cabinet, working with the president and his team, working with members of Congress, uh, and the Im immensely talented people at NOAA as a science agency, uh, almost 13 billion uh, people, I mean 13,000 people, sorry, $5 billion, 13 billion people, that's more than on the planet. <laughs> uh, $5 billion budget uh, doing uh, just incredible work, uh, whether it's on the ocean, coast, climate, uh, or weather, and the intersection of all those. Uh, I also had an opportunity uh, as Under Secretary of Commerce to work with not only members of Congress, uh, but governors and a lot of uh, citizens around the country. Uh, and uh, with uh, other people around the world, uh, because NOAA and the US, of course, partner with a lot of other nations. So doing a lot of interaction with leaders, with citizens, with fishermen, with people all, all over. And then for two years, as the, under as the first US science envoy for the ocean, uh, doing science diplomacy in China, in Indonesia, and in three countries in Africa, uh, working on ocean issues with those leaders. So a wealth of experience that really gave me some insight into uh, not only the problems and solutions, but how people are thinking about the ocean, how they're connected to it, how they depend upon it. And it's become increasingly obvious to me that there are some very obvious ways people understand that they are connected to the ocean. It provides for us. Uh, it feeds our souls and our imaginations as well as our bellies. Uh, people's livelihoods depend on the ocean. And so there are many ways that people know that they are connected to the ocean. But that isn't all of the way in which we need the ocean or are dependent upon it. The ocean also provides over half of the oxygen for the planet. So in addition to the things we know about, there are ways that we don't know about that we need from the ocean. The ocean absorbs over 90% of the excess heat that is trapped by greenhouse gases. That's a service that it provides to us. Climate change would be a lot worse than it is if the ocean weren't absorbing that excess heat. The ocean also absorbs around 30% of the carbon dioxide that we emit. And so all of those benefits that the ocean provides to us, we take for granted. We're cognizant of some of them, not others. We take them for granted. They've always been there. We think they always will be. But in fact, that may be changing. Those of us that live close to the ocean can see the bounty and the beauty. We can see some of what is happening. And this uh, helps us appreciate that for much of human history, the ocean has provided for people. It's been our grocery store. It's been our highways, our pharmacies, our playgrounds, our churches, our schools, our libraries. It's been an insurance policy against mistakes that we make in short, the ocean has been our life support system. People like scientists that are paying attention to the ocean, or fishermen that work on the ocean, or those of you who live close to the ocean, can see changes that are underway. And in fact, those changes are happening at sometimes frightening path, pace. Here's, in very brief, a summary of what we know. Over a century ago, the ocean was, for the most part, free of, well, yes, we had some local pollution, but most of the ocean did not have the kind of pollution that we see today, either nutrient pollution, plastic pollution, chemical pollution. And it was full of just teeming with fish, especially great big, huge top predators. Full ocean, just chock-a-block full of them playing a key important role that they play in maintaining the balance in ocean ecosystems. But today, the ocean is significantly depleted and disrupted. It's also polluted. 
uh, and it is warmer and is more acidic and it's less resilient than it used to be. And all of that has happened in a relatively short period of time as a result of a wide array of activities on land and in the ocean. The problems that are causing that are multiple. Things we do on land, things we do on water. But this is just a, 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 a summary just to anchor our thinking about some of the challenges. Overfishing is very real. So too is illegal fishing. Uh, loss of safe havens for wildlife. Most of the ocean used to be a de facto marine protected area, but it isn't any longer because we can go and fish and mine and drill pretty much everywhere. So we don't have the kind of safe havens that we used to to protect oceans and ocean ecosystems. Climate change and ocean acidification are uh, taking their toll on the ocean in many ways. Pollu pollution is a serious problem. But in addition to those, there is a very serious lack of awareness of the even existence of the solutions that I'm going to talk about, and there's a lack of political will. So I would lump all these together as some of our major challenges. And this is causing a lot of people to ask the question, um, is it even possible to meet the needs of people even today, much less tomorrow? Is it possible to use the ocean without using it up? Is it possible to do so in an equitable fashion? Is it hopeless? And I would suggest that no, it's not hopeless. The challenges are immense, but it is possible, and that's what we need to focus on. I see really encouraging progress happening, bubbling up all over the world as a result of many things that are underway. Many citizens are becoming more concerned. Many scientists are focusing on solutions, not just identifying and raising the alarm about problems. People are asking, okay, yes, this is a problem. How can we fix it? And many scientists that I know are doing things completely differently from what they used to. They're working with business people. They're working with politicians. They're working with community leaders to focus on solutions. That's different, and that is making a difference. Citizens are becoming engaged. Policymakers are beginning to take action. Business leaders have a key role to play here, and many of them are paying attention and saying, I need to be part of the solution, not just part of the problem. They're collaborating using two new technologies, and there is just a wealth of amazing stuff that is underway. So on the ocean, there's a lot of good stuff that's happening. It's just not at the scale that we need or the pace that we need. I'm gonna make that a little more concrete with two examples, one from fisheries reform and the other from marine protected areas. Not that those other issues aren't unimportant or there isn't good stuff underway, but just to give us something specific to focus on. So I'm gonna uh, do sort of this problem solution construct here and start with overfishing and talk a little bit about fishery reforms. Fisheries are incredibly important. Anybody who thinks about food security needs to be thinking about food from the ocean. The ocean provides uh, over three billion people with a significant fraction of their daily protein. It's really important for food security for the future, especially in developing countries. However, the way we have gone about fishing has been with that old, old mindset that the ocean is uh, immensely bountiful and immensely, infinitely resilient. Uh, and we've seen the fraction of the stocks that are developing plummet the fraction that are fully exploited go, uh, to, go down quite significantly. This is from 1950 to about 2010. The number of collapsed overexploited stocks has increased significantly and collapsed has increased quite dramatically. 50 years ago, uh, there was very little that was collapsed. Today, it's a significant fraction. 
So this has been the global pattern of fishing. And it's partly because we've been fishing harder and harder and exploiting newer and newer places, and we've run out of new places to fish. So fishing harder and harder for fewer and fewer returns. And that, in fact, has been a, a major challenge. And it has caused a lot of people to say, OK, uh, we can't get any more from the ocean. Where are we going to get it? Uh, people turning to aquaculture, which is absolutely going to be part of the solution. But we've seen some very encouraging progress in reforming fisheries so that we're fishing smarter, not harder, and can build stocks back up to be super abundant, and so that we can harvest uh, that, that uh, harvest fish from those wild stocks uh, in ways that uh, provide for more uh, fisheries, but also uh, healthier oceans. Science, in many ways, is driving a lot of the reforms that we've seen in fishery management. Uh, this is just one example of uh, some researchers. Um, Steve Gaines was one of Karina's uh, academic brothers uh, at uh, Oregon State University. His colleague, uh, Chris Costello, and their student, John Lynham, published a paper in 2008 that analyzed fisheries around the world. And they asked the simple question, does the type of fishery management used in a fishery matter? And they found the answer was, it matters hugely if fisheries uh, are managed with the traditional approach, uh, most of them are on this deep, deep, deep dive to collapse. Uh, those that are managed with a kind of rights-based management approach where fishermen are given a stake in the future and responsibility to be good stewards, uh, that number, those fisheries are, um, this, that number of fisheries that are managed has increased, and the fisheries that are managed with that tool that were on the decline are now stabilized. And so their conclusion was, if you design fishery management properly and switch to uh, a different type of management, <clears throat> you can turn fisheries around. The U.S., has an amazing story that nobody has heard about turning fisheries around. Uh, fisheries in the United States are more sustainable now than they've ever been after decades and decades of overfishing. And this is a result of a couple of things. One, uh, bipartisan legislation that was passed in 2006 that said, enough of this talk about sustainability. NOAA, as the manager of federal fisheries, has to end overfishing and rebuild those stocks. NOAA has to do that, take the, use that mandate to end overfishing by using science-based limits, making fisheries uh, fishermen accountable, and doing management on an ecosystem basis. And where it's appropriate, you may switch to this new type of fishery management that's called rights-based approaches, which give fishermen a voice and a stake in the future. Making that change to implementing this law was really, really hard. It was hard uh, for fishermen, it was hard for managers, it was hard for everybody, but it has been impressively successful. And I cannot give enough credit to some of the fishermen who have been leaders in making this switch and in reforming fisheries, recovering fisheries, and now reaping the bounty. Uh, so these are three of the fishermen that we were able to celebrate at the White House as champions of change. And here are some numbers to make this a little more concrete. These are fisheries in federal waters all around the US. And I'm going to compare the year 2000 and the year 2016. The number of over fished stocks that we had in the year 2000 was 92. That's bad. By the year 2016, we had slashed that to 36 because of these reforms. So there are still some overfished stocks that are there, but the number is just plummeting because of these reforms. Even more impressive, the number of rebuilt stocks has gone from zero in the year 2000 to 43 in the year 2016. 
So we are ending overfishing and rebuilding those stocks that had been depleted so they can again be fished sustainably. And that is an amazing turnaround story that is due to a lot of hard work. Since 2008, we've seen an increase in catches. We've seen an increase in the value. So fishermen are making more money, the fish are more valuable, and an increase in jobs because the stocks had been so depleted, there were fewer and fewer jobs, not much money to make. As the stocks become rebuilt, there's more bounty there, so more fish in the ocean to be part of ocean food webs, more fish can be caught, more value, everybody wins. Good triple bottom line. Not easy to get there, but if you can, then in fact it can be quite successful. The West Coast Ground Fish Fishery is a, a poster child for this turnaround. It, over time, uh, was a boom or bust fishery. Uh, it just was this bonanza all along the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, California, uh, f about 80 different species in this uh, fishery. Uh, and then <coughs> in 2000, the year 2000, uh, the, the fishery just collapsed. Uh, and it was declared a federal fishery disaster, completely closed, fishermen were out of jobs, fishermen told their kids, don't go into this business, there's no future, this is really awful, I can't pay back loans, can't pay for my boat, can't feed my family, really bad news. Uh, 2000, uh, after that, that was strong motivation for some of those courageous fishermen to work together with scientists, with managers, with politicians, and design an improved type of fishery management. And in 2011, this new rights-based management program began for the West Coast ground fish fishery. And the result of that was very rapid turnaround that surprised everybody. Um, a reduction in the accidental catch of the species that were most vulnerable, uh, which caused the fishery to be shut down. Uh, now, 13 of those species are certified by the Marine Stewardship Council as sustainable, so an independent third-party verifier of sustainability is saying, this is a good choice. And 40 species in this ground fish fishery are a best choice or a good alternative from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. So an amazing turnaround story because people were motivated to fix the problem and because the ocean in this case was still resilient. We caught it before uh, it was too late. So this is what I mean when I'm talking about fishing smarter, not harder. And we have examples from other fisheries around the US of this and examples from a number of other countries around the world. And this is something that is beginning to happen. At the global scale, we still have a lot of overfishing. Make no mistake about that. But now we have the tools and we know the secret ingredients for small-scale fisheries, for large-scale fisheries, to turn those around. In addition to that, the motivation for business people, in, for investors, for countries, for companies, is that the calculations that uh, Costello and Gaines and others have now published suggest that if we could reform all the fisheries in, uh, around the world and bring them back to a healthy state, that would give us a huge triple bottom line win, uh, over a 23% increase in harvest per year, so food security issue right there, Increase in profits, over 300%. Increase in fish biomass left in the water. So again, a huge triple bottom line potential that is actually getting the attention of major fishing countries like China, who says, oh, maybe there's, we should be paying more attention to fishery reform, not only pivoting to aquaculture and giving up on wild capture fishery, but doing both. And so there's some, this has caused a lot of interest in new dialogue. Companies are paying attention. This is a new partnership called CBOS that are the CEOs of the 10 largest seafood companies in the world, both aquaculture and wild capture fishery. And these CEOs have learned about climate change and they're worried. They've learned about illegal fishing. They know about illegal fishing, but they're now a spotlight's been shined on it. They've learned about some of these fishery reform potential, and they have said, we want to be 
part of the solution, not just part of the problem. And we're going to work together and work with scientists, in this case facilitated by scientists at the Stockholm Resilience Center, to move ahead and be better stewards than we have been. So this is pretty encouraging. That doesn't mean the job's done, but it's progress in the right direction. So I'm going to pivot now to focusing on marine protected areas uh, <coughs> and leave fishery reform for a moment. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that we now have very few safe havens. Most of the ocean used to be a de facto protected area, isn't anymore. We fish, we mine, we drill pretty much everywhere. Uh, and there is uh, new energy around creating fully to highly protected marine areas to restore these safe havens and accomplish other things. Again, we have a wealth of scientific information to help us understand what the problems are, what the solutions might be, and what the benefits of making some of the changes might be. This is a series of studies from the PISCO team uh, around the science of marine reserves uh, that have been done a number of places around. <coughs> and they tell us that studies of fully protected areas, no fishing, no extractive activity, no drilling, no mining, can produce huge increases in biomass, in density, in size, and diversity. So when you set up a marine protected area that's where no extractive activity is allowed, stuff gets big inside, it gets crowded, it gets abundant, and some of that bounty spills out to the adjacent areas. This figure shows different species of fish that were tagged inside a protected area and then swam outside and were caught outside. So there's a lot of spillover to the adjacent outside area. Marine protected areas that are fully protected allow fish not only to live but to get big, 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 big. It's what the fishermen call boffs. B-O-F-F-F. -F -F. Big, old, fat, female fish. Boffs. And the fishermen that I know have caps and t-shirts that say, save the boffs, save the boffs, because in fact they know how important those boffs are to the future of the fishery and the fish populations and the ecosystems. Here's an example. This is vermilion rockfish of a, about 15 inches. This individual produces 150,000 young. If you let this fish grow to be this big instead of catching it, if it's in a reserve, then it can grow to, in this case, 24 inches, it produces 1.7 million young. So a little bit larger size means lots more babies. And for the future of the population, those babies are a good thing. So protecting the big mamas, uh, whether they're fish or invertebrates, is really the secret to recovery as well as to the future. Some of that uh, bounty of the, the young that are produced are transported in ocean currents away from the protected area to adjacent outside areas, and that's what this figure shows. So protected areas can both protect biodiversity and habitats inside, but that bounty can help replenish depleted fisheries outside. We also know that if uh, protected areas, fully protected areas are large, then they can protect different types of habitats, and many species of fish and invertebrate occupy different habitats during different stages in their life cycle. And so to help them recover uh, requires protecting all of those different habitats. The ecological balance, the relationships among species, are restored inside a protected area. Having those big predators can help rebalance the system. And in many cases, sometimes fishery management goes awry and it, there was a miscalculation or some of the assumptions didn't work. And so protected areas can provide some insurance against accidental mismanagement or against something uncertain that was unforeseen. Finally, we're also learning that protected areas play a really critical role in making the ecosystem more uh, less likely to change and uh, better able to recover if it does change, if it bleaches or if something else happens. It can recover faster if it's a fully protected area than if it's a fished area. Uh, and so <coughs> this paper was a summary of a lot of different studies around the world showing that marine 
fully protected marine areas are more resilient in the face of climate change than areas that are outside. So this is seen increasingly as a new tool in the toolbox, not only to uh, help uh, mitigate uh, climate change, but also to provide adaptation to climate change. Knowing this evidence about all these benefits that protected areas do has gotten the attention of the countries of the world who have committed, both through the Convention on Biological Diversity and through the Sustainable Development Goals, to protect 10% of the ocean by 2020. So those commitments were made some time ago. 2020 is getting closer. And so people are saying, OK, how are we doing? Well, this is the cumulative area of the ocean that is protected, sort of in kilometers squared. And this is the percent of the ocean area. And you can see that the amount of protected area has been teensy, teensy, teensy tiny until just the last decade. And it has gone up very dramatically, although we're only at just shy of 4%. And that's implemented, so on the water protection. So long way to go before we get to 10. But on the other hand, look at this trajectory. You know, that's, that's, that's pretty impressive. So we've gone from 0.3% a decade ago to about 36 today. So an order of magnitude increase uh, or over that. So the current fraction <coughs> that is protected today is this 3.6 that's implemented. We have another 1.6 that's been designated. So a law that says, OK, this area will be protected, but that hasn't actually happened yet. Or proposed, a head of state might say, we're going to do this. So if we add all that up, we're close to 7.3% for all MPAs, all marine protected areas. Those that are strongly to fully protected, that have all those benefits that I just described, we only have 2% implemented. If we have another half percent designated, another half percent proposed. So this still uh, is, getting, is getting us closer to 7, uh, but we are not quite there uh, yet. You might ask, instead of the global numbers, how is the US doing, or how is California doing? Well, the US, when President Obama took office, 5% um, of the US exclusive economic zone was protected, uh, highly protected. By the time he left office, that had uh, more than fourfold increase, uh, was up to 23%. So uh, the US is one of the countries that's in the lead on this in terms of the fraction of its exclusive economic zone that is highly protected. Uh, California has been a leader in this space as well. Californians, lots of polls, this is PPIC, says 71% of Californians rate the condition of the ocean and beaches as very important to them personally. And more than three quarters of Californians say it's very important that California has MPA. So that's from a 2018 poll. California has 16% of its state waters, so that's shore to three nautical miles, and then the federal waters start. So 16% of state waters are in MPAs, and half of that about is highly to fully protected. So California is a leader in the ocean protection uh, in terms of its network of protected areas. And you see here the north central coast, and these are areas that are uh, fully to highly protected, both the reds and the blues here. Uh, and this network of protected areas was designed with scientific principles in mind to allow for connectivity from one to the other by the movement of juveniles or the movement of adults. Um, about 7% of the state plus federal waters is protected, so less, less well on the federal side off California. The results of this protection uh, have been, uh, information is now coming forth and being published about the results. Uh, targeted fish species like kelp bass, lobsters, sheephead are much larger, and they're more abundant inside those protected areas. And they are increasing, the targeted species are increasing in abundance outside. So some of that bounty is spilling out to adjacent areas. So the conclusions from the marine protected area part is that we've seen some strong science, we've seen some good partnerships, 
and changes in social norms, awareness uh, about the potential for this tool and increasing use to adopt it by countries have resulted in over an order to um, in increase in magnitude over the last decade. Um, it's less than countries have agreed to, and a lot of countries are now saying, you know, 10% probably isn't enough. We need more on the order of 30%. That's what IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, has called for, 30% in highly protected. So we have a long way to go on that front. The fully protected marine protected areas may be especially important in providing resilience to climate change. Uh, and finally, um, the challenge continues to be somebody who has to give up something, who's using a space, and to give it up and not use it anymore, there's, there's huge resistance to doing that. And so there's a lot of conversation around how to change that dynamic to be able for everyone to benefit indirectly, but also users that are giving it up to benefit directly from the uh, increase in bounty that we see. So there's some similarities across these two different areas and other areas that we've analyzed in terms of how do you make change happen. And some of those have to do with changing incentives. What are the incentives for the actors in a particular activity? Uh, and economics, changing the economic incentives in the case of the rights-based management for fishery, fishermen, benefited economically because the rights-based approach uh, enabled alignment of the short-term incentives and long-term incentives. Fishermen are rewarded for being good stewards, but also changes in social norms in what's the right thing to do, what do I personally believe, but also what uh, my friends believe. And both of those are changing behavior. And so changing the incentives can change, uh, convert a vicious cycle into a virtuous cycle. And it's both economic incentives, which a lot of people tend to think about when you talk about incentives, but the social, the the social incentives, whether it's social norms or personal norms, are also really important. So we've talked about sort of where I came from, why should you care, what are the problems, what are a few of the solutions. What's your role in this? And I would suggest that one of the biggest problems is that uh, most people aren't aware. Uh, some aren't even aware that they're problems. Uh, some th are aware of the problems, but tune out because they just seem too big to fix and too complicated, and there's enough other stuff going on. So they're not aware of the solutions. And therefore, there is a lack of hope and a lack of responsibility. I can do something about this. I think there actually is a lot of reason to be hopeful. There are good things that are happening. Uh, there's successful uh, knowledge to action examples. There's science-based policy reforms, are ending overfishing and rebuilding stocks. That's hopeful. There is resilience in those ocean ecosystems, and we can bring things back if we get on with doing it. We've seen increasing recognition of the importance of focusing on incentives and changing the incentives. We've seen a huge um, incentive in terms of the economic uh, and environmental potential of rebuilding fisheries, and we've seen increases in highly protected marine areas. Again, not enough, but enough to be encouraged that we could do more. So I think solutions exist. They're not at the scale that we need. So we need greater awareness and greater action to actually make that leap. What can individuals do? Well, staying informed, coming to listen here, but also staying informed on a routine basis, um, reducing your own footprint through your carbon footprint, your water footprint, your plastic footprint. That's something everybody uh, can do. What you choose to eat is really important. Not only sustainable seafood, sustainably caught or farmed, but eating lower on the food web is important, more plant-based diets. Uh, joining, supporting, uh, inventing uh, action groups so you can work with friends and colleagues. Voting is really important. Communicating with your elected officials is really important, and I'm constantly amazed at how many people don't do that. Um, but running for office is also a very viable option. So all of the above, please, folks. 
So the bottom line here, again, is that your future, your kids' futures, your grandkids' futures are highly dependent on the ocean. They're connected to the ocean. And so we need to care about what happens in the ocean, and we need to be better stewards. We need to understand some of these solutions. We need to make them happen. We need to accelerate the pace of change. And we've all seen situations where you can have a 180-degree flip in some attitudes towards something once enough people get motivated and make it happen. So that's what we need here. It's time for a new narrative. It's no longer the case that it's too big to fail. It's no longer the case that it's too big to fix. The new narrative is it is our future, and if we work together, we can fix it, and we must. It's the key to our future. And I would suggest that all of you can help make that happen. I start off saying, can we use the ocean without using it up? And I would say, it's tough. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. The task is daunting. Ecological limits are very real. But if we work together, if we pay attention to the science, we can make a change. We can make this happen. So my hope is that we can recover the bounty and we can use it wisely. I have three wonderful graduate students to thank for working with me on a lot of this work. And together we would say, enough folks of this doom and gloom. Uh, it's time to, pardon the pun, <laughs> seize the day, and to write a new narrative, one in which citizens and scientists are leading because they're taking a quantum leap for awareness and action because the ocean is our future. And my question to you is, will you help? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for a hopeful message. We're going to continue with some hope. For those of you who have joined us before, you know that um, we bring up some more of our graduate students. Uh, so I'm going to introduce two of our graduate students. They're going to interview Jane with a few questions they've prepared for her. Uh, and then after that, we'll open up for questions and answers from all of you. Uh, no, well, maybe answers too. Yeah, questions from all of you. We'll see how that goes. Um, so uh, give me a second here. We're going to raise the screen. And uh, while we're doing that, I'm going to introduce uh, Byron Riggins, one of my graduate students, and Salma Abdel Rahim. She's another one of our graduate students. They're both master's students here. They're full of hope. <laughs> They're working hard. Um, we're going to set up some chairs here. Just give us a sec. Uh, yeah, I think I'll just use this one. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Uh, first, just wanted to welcome you all here. Uh, it's a big honor to have such an engaged community, and I see a lot of familiar faces. So it's. <laughs> I guess I need to speak a little louder. Can you hear me now? Lovely. I was just giving thanks uh, to our guest here, such as yourself, for coming. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you all coming out here tonight, especially young scientists like myself. Um, I want to thank Dr. Luchenko for being here tonight, and I just wanted to ask, you brought up in your talk multiple times uh, the benefit of professionals from multiple disciplines working together, and it seems like even early on in your career, you recognize this benefit. Uh, my question to you is, how difficult do you find this in your daily professional life, and how might young scientists uh, support this cross-discipline collaboration? Thanks, Byron. That's a great question. Uh, and I think there's a lot behind that. Uh, you know, I was, uh, uh, my professional career was as a natural scientist. And at, at the time, we thought it was being really interdisciplinary if natural scientists worked together. You know, biologists would work with a chemist, with a physicist. <laughs> And you know that was interdisciplinary, and that was hard, we discovered, because people have different assumptions, different language, different terminology, different questions, different ways of conceiving of things. 
And we sort of realized that there was a lot of um, benefit in doing that. It was hard. It also depended a lot on getting the right chemistry between the right players. You couldn't just throw any biologist together with any chemist and have that work. It kind of took the right people that kind of synced and you know, connected with each other. And so that was a good benefit. And then we uh, began to realize that a lot of, for example, environmental problems are not just uh, a natural science problem, it's uh, a connection between, or a disconnect between the natural science and social sciences because a lot of the challenges are about human behavior. Why do people do what they do? Why do they think what they think? Why do they act the way they do? And so there began more increased conversations about how do we bring natural scientists and social scientists together uh, and that was even tougher because, you know, the language barrier, you know, you say one thing and somebody means something totally different by that term. So that took a lot of time. It takes time to do that. And the, some of the lessons learned from that were that if you can have people focus on a place, that can bring different perspectives together. Or if you can focus on a problem, you can't just sort of say, okay, we're going to work together. You actually have to work together on something, and either a place-based problem or a, I mean, a, a, a place. How does this place work? How does it change? How can, you know, what do we want from it? That's a place-based focus. Or a, a problem-based focus, how do we end over fishing? You know, that requires different perspectives. So those are, uh, sort of having a, a place or a problem, having the right chemistry, having a lot of time to build the new vocabulary, the new understanding, the new framework are all really important. And now people are realizing that the humanities are really important here too because what people do and care about is not just um, about social science, it's also about um, art and about, uh, you know, how they, you know, art can speak to people in ways that economic numbers don't speak to them. Uh, so all of that is really important and we've, uh, over time, people are sort of figuring this out. Now, a lot of people have known that for a long time, but to have scientists be able to actually deliver on this is uh, increasingly important. And so that's m bringing people together in ways just because of the seriousness of the problems. So I'm hopeful that you students are being exposed to some of that breadth and depth. And I know that you have some programs that are doing that interdisciplinary training. The challenge in that is making sure that your knowledge is not just super, super, super skinny across a lot of different areas, but you have some depth as well. People call it the T. So you need some breadth and you need some depth and you can choose where that T is. Uh, and then the other element of that is not just thinking about doing it all yourself, but collaborating and working in teams and figuring out what that means and what your natural space is. Are you a natural leader? Are you a natural follower? Uh, what is your skill set and how do you learn to be a good team member uh, given your own personality? So all of that wonderful opportunities for you guys. Um, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just, gonna go on. Um, just also speaking on, uh, in your last response, you spoke a little bit about, uh, you know, young science. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear be, me now? Be, be the rock star here. <laughs> of course. Thank you, thank you. Um, you spoke about the importance of uh, young professionals and young scientists getting these sorts of opportunities uh, early on in their career. I know that you are from Colorado, which is a landlocked state, and through that and spending a lot of time as a Girl Scout when you were younger, you were exposed to the terrestrial environment. However, you attribute a summer zoology course at Woods Hole, a marine biological laboratory just like ours, as the catalyst for your career in marine science. and. I just wanted to know, can you speak a little bit on the importance of supporting and participating in these sorts of events uh, for young scientists or other people in fields of study who may not otherwise have the opportunity to enjoy them? 
Yeah, I'm a firm believer, Byron, in uh, learning by doing and being exposed to things. And I think that one of the uh, greatest gifts that my parents gave me was a chance to explore and do a wide variety of different things and figure out what I liked, what I was good at by doing it. And uh, having chances to do that uh, has, has been really important. Um, a lot of the teaching today is, has shifted from just book learning to experiential learning, giving kids hands-on opportunities. I think that's incredibly important. Um, and that's not only in the classroom, it's out in nature. And getting kids out in nature is incredibly important. Many of you know the um, book, uh, No Child Left uh, Inside. Uh, it, it, you know, and, and that's sort of uh, an important thing. My mantra is, no kid left dry. Because uh, we need to get them wet as well as uh, in, 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 out in nature, both on the ground as well as in the ocean. Uh, so, but having opportunities to be at a marine lab is just incredible. Uh, and those of you who are here uh, ha can experience that, both just being inspired by the water. But I see problems both from observing what's happening and then asking, hey, why is that happening? You know, that shouldn't be here, or why is that happening? So um, problems can be identified from observing as well as from just sitting around thinking about them, and different people operate different ways. Uh, but having a chance to go to a different place. You grew up in Philadelphia, yeah, so far. here you are in <laughs> California. <laughs> Uh, so that, that chance to see different places, see, experience different cultures, experience different ecosystems, experience different solutions is a rich part of your education. And so uh, kudos to you for coming all the way across the country and taking full <laughs> advantage of this. And I hope you get to go to lots of other places as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I got mm -hmm. a, uh, a lot of crazy looks as a youngster telling people in a inner city that I wanted to be a marine biologist, but I can imagine. Those looks are crazy for a different reason. But I now. can imagine. <laughs> but you listened to your heart. I did. And Thank that's you. important. Keep doing that. Thank you. Well, okay. So, <laughs> okay, so if you guys thought you couldn't hear Byron earlier, I actually don't have a voice, so <laughs> hopefully the mic will amplify whatever is left of it. Um, but thank you all for being here today, and thank you, Dr. Lubchenco, for an awesome talk. Um, I had a couple of questions that had a, more of a focus on the talk you just gave. Uh, so first, I kind of just wanted to ask about the two tools that you talk about that we have in our arsenal to help protect the oceans, our marine fisheries management, and ecosystem protect protections. Um, however, at first glance, it kind of seems like the two are in direct conflict with one another. Um, usually, uh, for marine protection, you, a lot of large areas of the ocean are closed off to extractive activities like fishing, um, either indefinitely or for set periods of time. And all of marine fisheries management is all about fishing smarter, um, not harder, to feed the growing global population. So then how does the math add up? Um, mm -hmm. How can we feed? this growing global population, but still working to attain these large conservation goals? Yeah. Great question, Selma. Thank you. Uh, they do seem uh, at odds, and all too often they are framed as choices. And there are some uh, folks who think all we need to do is use the ocean sustainably, um, not protect any of it, just have really good fishery management, really good management of other activities, and that, in fact, will be sufficient. Uh, so that's an either-or framing. Um, there are others that will say, no, we need much more of, you know, we probably need half of the ocean. So um, E.O. Wilson, famous uh, biologist, has now called for protecting half of nature, uh, half of the planet, so it's called Half Earth is his book. And some people have taken up that mantra not only for land but for the ocean. And you may have seen a big announcement by Hans Jörg Wies uh, last week that said he's donating a billion dollars over the next 10 years to achieve the goal of 30% of land and the ocean protected by 2030. 
So a lot of people are talking about much bigger numbers for protection than in fact is currently in place. My response is that that either or framing is a false dichotomy. It's not either use the ocean sustainably or protect it. It is we need both. And um, I think the question is how do we use the ocean without using it up? And that means both protecting places um, with fully protected, highly protected areas, in part because um, those places provide benefits that even sustainable fisheries can't provide. Sustainable fisheries don't necessarily protect those big old fat female fish. They don't protect uh, habitats. They're removing biomass from the ocean that is providing food for other fishes, for marine mammals, for seabirds. So the simple act of taking stuff out of the ocean, even if it's done in a way that is sustainable for the fishery, still has an impact on the ecosystem. And we need those intact, resilient ocean ecosystems, especially as we're seeing the oceans warm, becoming more acidic. Uh, we have a bottleneck that is coming, and by protecting uh, large amounts, not only of species, but of the genetic biodiversity, is going to give us the best chance of making it through this coming bottleneck of a warmer, more acidic ocean because the more genetic diversity we're protecting, the more likely it is we're going to have some of those genotypes be able to manage under warmer, more acidic conditions. So I see protected areas as a hedge against uncertainty, as an insurance policy against climate change and ocean acidification and accidental mismanagement, as well as part of our responsibility as stewards for the rest of life on Earth. Uh, it's not just here, I believe, to use. It's also ours to take care of. And so I think we need a combination of protected areas and smart, sustainable use outside, and that both of those together are the answer, not one versus the other. So it's all about how the two can work together. Yep, exactly. Yep. That's good. Um, so then my last question for you is, um, so you were instrumental in developing these ITQs or catch shares mm -hmm. um, that basically set these quotas that fishermen can uh, catch for a certain fishery. And some small scale fishers have worried that uh, these quotas can be grouped together by a single larger fisheries, like corporate fisheries, um, and used to push out smaller scale fishers out of the market. And I was just wondering, how do you think we can go about managing these larger scale fisheries? Yep, yep. Great, very insightful question. Um, I talked in my remarks about uh, rights-based approaches to fishery management. Um, <clears throat> that's sort of a catch-all bucket that comes in lots of different uh, flavors. One of those flavors are ITQs, which stands for Individual Transferable Quotas. That's one type of a rights-based approach. There are other ones. Um, in the US, the common language is catch shares for these rights-based approaches, but that doesn't always translate internationally. Um, some of the early rights-based approaches to fisheries were not well designed and they did exactly what you identified as a problem, which is consolidation. That one person or one company can buy up all the shares and uh, essentially have a monopoly and put everybody else out of business. And that's something that a lot of fishermen uh, have worried about. Uh, many of the early lessons, the early experiments that were done with um, catch shares way before my time, uh, sort of figured out that it's not a problem with a rights-based approach, it's the design of that particular uh, implementation that was um, flawed. And 
what we did when I was at NOAA was to tell the fishery management councils that are producing management plans for the different fisheries, if rights-based approaches, if catch shares, you think are a good fit for this fishery, and they're not a panacea, they're not going to be appropriate for all fisheries, if they are a good one for that fishery, um, then you need to design them in ways that prevent consolidation and that do a number of other things that were lessons learned from previous examples. So the trick is not whether to use them or not, it's how to design it if you choose to use it, how to design it in a way that can take advantage of the rich experiences and have it have the greatest benefit for all the fishermen in the fishery. And in fact, that's what we've seen uh, happen in a number of the fisheries, that, that there is a cap. Many of the fisheries now that are using catch shares uh, say you cannot own any more than 10% of the quota. So then, then you don't have a monopoly. You can also give a quota to an entire community or to, um, so it's, it's it, it, pretty much anybody can hold the shares. It's not just the, um, you know, a big business. You can, you can make sure that part of the quota is for small boat owners, part of the quota, you know, some fraction of it is for communities. So you can design it in different ways. And a lot of that is being implemented uh, internationally in terms of the, the uh, rights-based approaches that are available um, around the world. So um, lots of lessons learned from painful experiences, but I think the bottom line for these rights-based approaches is, again, they're not a panacea, but they can be a very powerful tool because they can align conservation and economic incentives. They can align the short-term and the long-term and reward fishermen for being good stewards uh, in a way that allows them to um, thrive not only today but tomorrow and have the fishery stay healthy because it's in their own interest to have the fishery be healthy and fishermen know that and they just struggled under traditional fishery management because they were forced to fish hard 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 because if I don't catch all the fish you're going to and they knew that that was not in their long-term interest but the short-term economic drivers incentives we're forcing that overfishing. And so if you flip to rewarding them for being good stewards, uh, then that can in fact be the, the, the magic sauce that can turn things around, and that's what we've seen. Thank you, that's awesome. All right, so we're gonna open up the floor, but before we do that, I wanna give a round of applause to Byron yeah. and Salma. <laughs> Great work. Um, Byron and Selma are going to uh, walk up and down the aisles and uh, help you amplify your voice when you ask your questions. Uh, so I'm going to give them the microphones and uh, feel free to raise your hand if you have a question. I get to pick. You're not going to yeah. pick? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Who wants to? No. <laughs> Brian. Yeah, please let oh. me. Oh, oh, ho, ho. I, this is experience. I have a collection of these at home, so <laughs> it's a very good. Uh, um, actually, one quick question, uh, but I, I've got a much broader one. The quick one is, I thought you said 23% of the EEZ is protected, which kind of shocked me, and I thought, is that because of the Northwest Hawaiian Islands? Is that what did it? <clears throat> so 23% of the U.S. exclusive economic zone is in highly protected status. Um, that's largely a function of the three national marine monuments that President Obama uh, proclaimed, including Papahanaumokuakea, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Uh, he expanded, uh, President George W. Bush created uh, the first monument there. President Obama expanded it. Same thing with the Pacific Remote Islands. And then President Obama created the first one in the Atlantic, the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts, and those three are large enough area that you get, that's most of the 23%. Thank you, because that surprised me, actually. Yep, um, it yeah, is, it's it, a big number. But here's the big question. Okay. Um, here you are, you know, you're a scientist, you know the ins and outs of the science of marine protected areas and all these fishery management issues, et cetera, and you've sat on the, the uh, you know, basically run the, the ocean organization for the, for the nation, NOAA. 
What do you think is happening now with the repeal of the national ocean policy, with the, uh, just eviscerating all of the air quality things with the you know, uh, power plant uh, production, uh, the, the horrific things that appear to be happening with water quality, and you know, this whole evening is about hope. And so you have much, I mean, I've been doing this stuff for 40 years. I cannot quite get what's happening, how bad it really is, and I would just like your assessment on what you think is happening. How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing that Brian, uh, actually, when the rest of you uh, ask a question, would you introduce yourself? I happen to know Brian Baird, so uh, he didn't introduce himself, but everybody else should. Um, so one of the things that we worked hard on was to create a national ocean policy for the U.S. And um, current or before that time, uh, the practices and policies having to do with the ocean for the U.S. are just this hodgepodge of issues. It's issue by issue, sector by sector. One agency manages fisheries, one does laying of cables, another one does clean, or does energy, another one does water quality. So it's distributed across all these different federal agencies, and then th those federal agencies do or don't interact with the state agencies and th with the local agencies. And so this, it's, it's this morass of stuff, conflicting jurisdictions. So sometimes they're overlaps and conflicts, sometimes they're gaping holes. And one thing that we did uh, when I was at NOAA was to uh, create the dialogue and then make recommendations to the president to create the first national ocean policy, which said healthy oceans matter and we need to work together to ensure that they are healthy, productive, and resilient. And that means agencies have to talk to one another and it means the feds need to talk to the regions. So uh, there's a West Coast region, so the three West Coast states are in a single large marine ecosystem. They're connected by the Pacific Coast off their shores, the same in the Gulf, the same in the Atlantic. So there needs to be a mechanism for coordinating and each region should produce a plan that says, here's our ocean, what do we want from it? With some guidelines about it needs to uh, be something that can be sustainable. Uh, and the idea was to deconflict all the uses. The ocean is becoming increasingly crowded place, and there are more needs, more new things that are happening, clean energy, uh, more needs for energy, more interest in aquaculture. So increasing conflicts. So let's figure out what we're going to, let's do a marine spatial plan. What are we going to do where in with the goal of deconflicting, but also the goal of um, ensuring that the ecosystem remains healthy because healthy oceans matter and that's what we want. So we put in place this national ocean policy that had the provisions for the feds to talk and the feds to interact with regions and create these uh, plans, regional ocean plans. Um, President Trump uh, undid that, the executive order so he, so President Obama established the national ocean policy with an executive order. President Trump issued his own executive order about the ocean, and it was essentially throwing out everything we did uh, and saying all we want from the ocean is more, more, more exploitation. So more fishing, more drilling, more mining, uh, without any safeguards. So in my view, that is uh, the absolutely the wrong thing to do and really uh, is a problem. Uh, however, the regional ocean plans that had been put in place by those regions that were out in front in the planning, so uh, the New England and the Mid-Atlantic got their plans out early on and they're great plans. And because of the time and energy that they invested in it, bringing together businesses, bringing together the fishermen, bringing together all of the, the state agencies, NGOs, citizens, big process, what do we want where, those plans are still in place and they're moving along with what they had agreed to do. Uh, despite the fact that sort of the overarching mandate doesn't exist anymore, but because they like it and it's working for them, 
that's happening. So that's actually, I think, a really interesting outcome and a good message. I would be hopeful that sometime in the future we can again have uh, an overarching mandate that says um, we want to have balance in our oceans, not just exploitation. We need to use it without using it up. Um, the other thing that I would say <clears throat> is that a lot of the other things that we did under uh, my tenure at NOAA are still in place in large part because for the same reason, they're working for people. And so the fishery reforms that we put in place uh, for uh, the many of the uh, federally managed fisheries are still in place in part because fishermen are benefiting from it. So they're not clamoring for change. There are a few exceptions to that, uh, and I have my fingers crossed that we don't unroll some of that. So even though there has been a rollback of a lot of the things that were done uh, in terms of climate change, uh, energy, uh, energy regulations, um, not all of what we did has been undone. Uh, and I think you all saw, especially with the recent uh, Global Climate Action Summit that was in San Francisco a month ago, that despite the fact that our federal government is not leading the charge on climate change, that states and businesses and local communities and citizens, uh, faith-based groups, youth, are all, you know, we are still in uh, and are still moving ahead. So uh, it's a, a mixed uh, outcome in terms of what's happening now. Um, that's partly why yesterday was really important and it's partly why the future is important. And it's why uh, I think it's important that citizens be as engaged as possible in crafting the solutions so that we have elected leaders that are really reflecting uh, what most people believe in and, and people want. And if you poll most, if you poll Americans, most people say they think climate change is a problem. They think that we need regulation to help solve that. Uh, and it's just our leadership uh, and uh, Congress that are out of sync with where the bulk of the uh, American people are. So we still have our work to do, uh, and I hope that you will all be involved in helping address some of those major challenges because it affects all of us, but especially our kids, our grandkids, uh, and the quality of life for, for all of us. So I'm going to go over here and take a question, then we'll go over here, and then we'll see how we're doing on time. So right back here. Yep. 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 Hi, I'm Sarah Hamid, and I work with Marine Conservation Institute. And you talked, Jane, tonight about um, where we are with protecting ocean ecosystems globally, um, how far we've come in the last decade or so, um, and how far we have to go, particularly with those strongly protected MPAs. What do you see as the biggest challenges to getting to those 10% goals by 2020 in the next couple of years? And what are the right incentives to help us get there? What should we be leveraging in terms of the incentives to get there? Yep. So great questions. Um, I think uh, if you ask most people uh, how much of the ocean is protected, a lot of people say, oh, maybe 20% or something. You know, it's around there. So people think a lot more is protected than is. Uh, currently, about 17% of the land is protected, and I told you 3.6% of the ocean is protected. So it's a huge difference. It doesn't even compare to what's on land. So first of all, people think more is protected than is. They get um, parks on land. People love parks. You guys had a great, California had a great Parks Forward Commission that made a lot of great recommendations about parks. People get parks on land. They get green parks. They don't really think about blue parks. It's not that they're against them. It's just that it's just not on their radar screen. So greater awareness uh, is number one, greater awareness about what we have, what we don't have, and what are the benefits of having it. So the kind of benefits that I described tonight, the bounty can return, ecosystems can be resilient if we give them a half a chance. We can help uh, export that bounty. Some people are calling protected areas fish banks. 
So, you know, you can have a bank that's uh, providing um, the, uh, so you have, you know, you're protecting your capital and then you've got the interest that is uh, colonizing or spreading out and you can spend the interest but protect the capital. So there are a lot of analogies that people are using. So helping folks understand what the potential is, uh, is important. I mentioned earlier the um, social norms and changing of social norms. When Secretary Kerry was Secretary of State, he created a conference called the Our Ocean Conference, the first one of which was held in 2014. And he thought it was important to elevate oceans on the international diplomacy stage. He said to me, when the presidents of countries get together, they don't talk about the ocean. When foreign ministers get together, they don't talk about the ocean. It's usually an issue of trade, or it comes up with environment ministers. He said, we need to elevate the ocean to the very top levels. And so he created this conference called the Our Ocean Conference and invited heads of state and foreign ministers to come and make ocean announcements. And he said, if you make a big, bold announcement, you have to deliver. None of this talk, 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 no do. Make it one year, come back the next year, and say you've done it. So there was a, a, a very strong focus on accountability. Second Our Ocean Conference was hosted by Chile. President Bachelet was there. Uh, Foreign Minister Eraldo Munoz was there, and they made some big, bold commitments and announcements, so they sort of carried on the, uh, the, um, what Kerry had started. Kerry hosted the third. The EU hosted the fourth. The fifth one was just in Bali last week. I just came directly from that here. And that, our ocean conference, has sort of become a way that oceans and protected areas, to your question, have been much more higher focused uh, around the world. And when one president announces, I'm going to do this and create a protected area, Others pay attention, say, oh, hey, me too. I want in on this game. Look at all this great publicity. So that can be useful, but not if it's done at the expense of a good process within that country where there's consultation, there's bottom-up involvement. You can't just impose things on people. You need a combination of bottom-up and top-down working together. And that, in fact, is what's most durable, because you, you don't want a bunch of paper parks. You want parks that are actually going to be delivering, which means there's good compliance and good enforcement. So having, changing the social norms at the highest levels, but also within communities, have, having communities benefit from protected areas and networking with other communities and saying, hey, this is what we're doing. What are you doing? There's a new tool that is being uh, experimented with that combines rights-based approaches with protected areas. So to Salma's question, are they at odds? Well, this is a tool that brings them together. One type of rights-based approach is spatially based. It's called a TURF, stands for T-U-R-F, Territorial User Rights Fisheries. And so the rights, exclusive rights to fish in an area are allocated to, let's say, a community. Nobody else can fish there, only the people who are from that community. And that right to fish exclusively can be conditional on that community creating a no-take protected area in the middle of that area. So then you have some conservation benefit the bounty is uh, increasing, spilling out to the adjacent area, and the fishermen that have given up this area inside are now reaping the benefits by being able to fish in the area that they can fish in, and nobody else can come in and poach it because this is exclusive rights that they have. So there are creative ways to mix and match some of these different tools, and we're seeing a lot of cool experiments to do that. So having communities talk to one another about what are we doing, what are you doing, how can we solve these problems collectively is part of the equation as well. 
So awareness and action, uh, but, but empowered by experience and by scientific information, changing social norms, changing incentives, all of those are part of the equation. So do we have time for one more? Short. Karina says, keep it short. Okay, one more over here. Yes. And Salma's coming right here with a microphone. She's going to let you introduce yourself before oh, yes. you leap into I'm your Suzanne question. I'm Suzanne Reeson, and I just have a short question. So you just spoke about this. So in the turf area, and they, in the middle, have a protected area. What is the time frame when we're going to get the spill out? Is it one year, 10 years? What is that time frame? Great so question. That the perimeter says, yep. wow, this is working. Yep, yep. So that's a great question. Uh, and sort of a typical scientific answer, it depends. <laughs> so some species grow very rapidly, reproduce quickly, and you'll see bounty immediately. You can see increases in the individuals, and that's what the scientists that have studied these areas see. Some populations respond very quickly, and sometimes they're spillover pretty much immediately. Others respond a lot more slowly if they are very slow growing, reproduce later in life. Uh, and typically, when you see, when you create a protected area, you'll see continuous changes through time, year after year after year, as new things are coming in, as the slower growing ones become more abundant more slowly than, than the fast growing ones. So you typically see some stuff spill over immediately. It may not be the target species that you are interested in. And so to answer that question, you need to know a little bit of biology. You need to know something about the life history of the species that you are interested in. Typically, you will get some things benefit immediately, others taking time. In the case of the um, West Coast groundfish fishery that I described to you, uh, the recovery, this is not protected areas now, but the recovery was so much more rapid than people had anticipated uh, because um, fishermen were actively avoiding places where there were the vulnerable species. And so they recovered a lot faster than anybody thought they would because fishermen were incentivized to avoid them in ways that hadn't happened before. Uh, but with protected areas, you can have some things recovering quickly, other things taking longer time, uh, just like you would with uh, a forested area on land. Some things are gonna come back very quickly some trees that grow really quickly are going to recover fast. Others, uh, really late uh, maturing, long-lived, are going to recover a lot slower. So you get both. So I want to thank you all and apologize that the answers were long and we don't have time for all the questions. <laughs> and I'm going to turn this back to Karina. Okay. Well, let's give a r round of applause to Jane. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to thank our two students, Salma and Byron, for helping us out. Well done. I'm going to say a quick thank you to all our staff who worked really hard to make this event. I can't I don't have time to name everyone, but thank you very, very much for all your hard work. And lastly, I do want to thank uh, Barbara and Richard Rosenberg, who endowed the series. Uh, we are incredibly grateful for their support and our ability to bring great speakers like Jane here to the community. And I want to thank all of you for supporting us and our work. And um, have a hopeful evening. <laughs> thank you for coming.